Okay, welcome, welcome. Here is the last of the four reading videos. This is video uh, 304. Um, if you haven't watched video 301, I would strongly recommend doing that before kind of playing along, along with me on this uh, 304 video. Why do I say that? I say that because the 301 video goes through a lot of the techniques uh, that we'll use um, and we'll implement on this specific practice. So 301 is all of the how to do the reading. So it's important to kind of have knowledge of that how to. And then 302, 303, and 304 is implementing it on the different types of SAT passages. Uh, but anyway, if you feel comfortable continuing with this video, having not watched 301, or if you've already watched 301, uh, let's go, let's begin. So anyway, uh, the passage we're about to read is the SAT history passage. So it's the history or the primary source passage. And if you remember from the 301 video, the key things that we really want to key in on here is the context of kind of the time and the speaker. So in this case, it's 1938, we have Virginia Woolf, who considers the situation of women in English society. So what we wanna know immediately is what is her position? What position does she hold on uh, women in English society in 1938? And how does she speak to her audience and try to convince them of her position? So that's what we're gonna be looking out for essentially what is Virginia Woolf's thesis on this societal topic? What does she think women, how involved does she think women should be in English society at this time? Okay, so anyway, let's begin our reading. And again, it's about six and a half minutes reading, six and a half minutes answering questions roughly. Obviously we'll spend a little longer because we're doing it together, but on the test you have 13 minutes. So about 50-50 on each. Okay, let's do it. So close at hand is a bridge over the River Thames, an admirable vantage ground for us to make a survey. The river flows beneath, barges pass, laden with timber, bursting with corn. There on one side are the domes and spires of the city, on the other, Westminster and the House of Parliament. It is a place to stand on by the hour dreaming, but not now. Now we are pressed for time. Now we are here to consider facts. Now we must fix our eyes upon the procession, the procession of the sons of educated men. Okay, so the whole entire first paragraph leads to the procession of sons of educated men. So this must be an important procession. Procession is just a line or a walking. So you have a bunch of sons of educated men who are walking across this bridge that goes over the river Thames. So let's see what Virginia Woolf has to say about them. There they go our brothers who have been educated at public schools and universities, mounting those steps, passing in and out of those doors, ascending those pulpits, preaching, teaching, administering justice, practicing medicine, transacting business, making money. It is a solemn sight always, a procession like a caravan soirée crossing a desert. But now, and we always make note of key transitions, key shifts in tone, or just context, but now for the past 20 years or so, it is no longer a sight merely, a photograph or fresco scrawled upon the walls of time at which we can look with merely an aesthetic appreciation. For there, trapezing along at the tail end of the procession, we go ourselves. So we have to figure out who we is. Well, I'm sure you can probably take a guess or pause this video and think about it, but we is kind of this collective group of women. Because if you remember, Virginia Woolf is considering the situation of women in English society. So she's saying that for the longest time, if you looked at this procession of men walking across the bridge, it was something that uh, could be a fresco scrawled upon the walls of time. Meaning it remained unchanged. It was just the same kind of men walking across the bridge doing the same types of jobs. But now within the last 20 years, it has changed. The shift is, but now at the end of this photograph, we have we, which is the women. And she says, and that makes a difference. We who have looked so long at the pageant in books or from a curtained window, watch educated men leaving the house. 
at about 9.30 to go to an office, returning to the house at about 6.30 from an office, need look passively no longer. So she's presenting this opportunity to women. She's saying women are involved in kind of going to work in the city of London and they can be more involved if they want. We too can leave the house, can mount those steps, pass in and out of those doors, make money, administer justice. We who now agitate these humble pens may in another century or two speak from a pulpit. Nobody will dare contradict us then. We shall be the mouthpieces of the divine spirit. A solemn thought, is it not? It's really funny. She's saying that women will become pastors in a century or two. This is 1938. Clearly, she didn't even necessarily see how quickly uh, society would progress. Because um, clearly today in 2021, we have plenty of women preachers. Uh, who can say whether as time goes on, we may not dress in military uniform with gold lace on our breasts, swords at our sides, and something like the old family coal scuttle on our heads. Save that venerable object was never decorated with plumes of white horse hair. You laugh, indeed, and then you. So you have to really think about who her audience is. Who, who do you think she's speaking to? When she says we over and over again, she's trying to influence the women of society to kind of consider uh, their role in society. You laugh. Indeed, the shadow of the private house still makes those dresses look a little queer. We have worn private clothes so long, but we have not come here to laugh or to talk of fashions, men's and women's. We are here on the bridge to ask ourselves certain questions. So she's relating this bridge to uh, questions that women need to ask themselves. And we'll see what these questions are. And they are very important questions. And we have very little time to answer them. So there's definitely a sense of urgency around these questions. The questions that we have to ask and to answer about the procession during this moment of transition are so important that they may well change the lives of all men and women forever. For we have to ask ourselves here and now on these important questions, do we wish to join the procession or don't we? So think about what that means. It's, she's essentially saying, do we as women want to be involved in these jobs in the public sphere? Do we want to take on the same roles that men do? On what terms shall we join the procession? And above all, where is it leading us? The procession of educated men. The moment is short. It may last five years, 10 years, or perhaps only a matter of a few months longer, but you will object. You have no time to think. You have your battles to fight, your rent to pay, your bazaars to organize. So she's saying there are women who will say, I can't be bothered to answer this urgent question now. I can't be bothered to think about whether or not I want an expanded role in society similar to that of a man. Well, Virginia Woolf says, that excuse shall not serve you, madam. As you know from your own experience, and, th and there are facts that prove it, the daughters of educated men have always done their thinking from hand to mouth, not under green lamps at study tables in the close stairs of secluded colleges. So she's saying women haven't had the, the fortunate opportunity to go off to colleges and just kind of think and study and only focus on that. They've had to do it hand to mouth. So what does she mean by that? They've thought while they stirred the pot, while they rocked the cradle. It was thus that they want us to write to our brand new sixpence. It falls on us to go on thinking, how are we to spend that sixpence? Think we must. Let us think in offices and omnibuses while we are standing in the crowd watching coronations and Lord Mayo shows. Let us think. So she's essentially saying women in the past, while they've carried on their kind of domestic duties and female duties, they've also pressed for more rights. Right, they've done the thinking on what you know role they would want in society, and through that thinking, they've earned this brand new sixpence, meaning they've earned kind of women at the end of this procession, this this opportunity. Anyway, in the gallery of the House of Commons, in the law courts, let us think at bapt baptisms and marriages and funerals. Let us never cease from thinking. What is this civilization in which we find ourselves? What are these ceremonies, and why should we take part in them? What are these uh, professions and why should we make money out of them? Where in short is it leading us? The procession of the sons of educating men. So before we hit the questions, you should kind of say to yourself, what is Virginia Woolf's thesis and how does she go about convincing the audience of it? Hopefully what you've come up with is her thesis is, 
now is the time for women to consider an expanded role in society and, and whether or not that makes sense for them. So that is her thesis. How does she develop it? Well, she talks about kind of this opportunity being short-lived and kind of this opportunity being something that's of the moment and needs to be enacted and seized upon. And she just references kind of how women have earned rights throughout history by, you know, doing the thinking even while they're busy. Okay, so let's take a look at 32. So the main purpose of the passage is to emphasize the value of tradition. Well, she's not trying to emphasize maintaining the way things are. She's offering a change. Stress the urgency of an issue. So that issue would be whether or not women want an expanded role in society. And the urgency is how she makes tons of references about how now is the time. Highlight the severity of social divisions. I don't think she's talking about anything being severe. Question the feasibility of an undertaking. Uh, so you could say she maybe she's questioning whether or not women can press for more issues, but I don't think she ever talks about whether or not it's possible. She kind of says this opportunity is possible. We just need to decide whether or not we want to press for it. So she's not questioning whether or not we can do it, do it. She's saying we as women, we can press for this. We just need to decide if we want to. So 32 is big. And if you want proof for stressing the urgency, uh, we are here on the bridge to ask ourselves certain questions and they are very important questions and we have very little time to answer them. And she kind of con continues on this idea of how important the questions are and how pressing the moment is. Okay, the central claim of the passage is that educated women face a decision about how to engage with existing institutions. Uh, yeah, potentially, she talks about how we, the educated women, the, the sons and daughters of educated, or sorry, the daughters of educated men need to kind of make a decision about whether or not we want to be part of the military, judges, religious leaders. Uh, women can have positions of influence in English society only if they give up some of their traditional roles. So that only if is a big one. And she never says that it's necessary for women to give up their traditional roles. The male monopoly on power in English society has had grave and continuing effects. So we don't want to make assumptions. She never says that men having most of the power of English in English society is a bad thing. She never really says that. The entry of educated women into positions of power traditionally held by men will transform those positions. Um, I see that as a point. But she does talk about women being able to join these positions that men hold. She never talks about women necessarily making them different. So that we got to be really careful. Every single word needs to check out. So this one's going to be A. OK. So why does Wolf use the word we? Well, we talked about this throughout reading the passage. She uses the word we to establish a collective amongst women. We must think. We must do this now. So reflect the growing friendliness among a group of people. Uh, never really talks about the women becoming kind of closer together. Advance the need for candor among a group of people. So she's not really using we to saying we need to be honest with ourselves. Establish a sense of solidarity among a group of people. Yes, she's saying we as a collective group of women need to make a decision together. Reinforce the need for respect. Um, okay, so no, definitely not did. Okay. 35, according to the passage, Wolf chooses the setting of the bridge because it is conducive to a mood of fanciful reflection, maybe. We'll look in that first paragraph to figure out why she chose the bridge. Provides a good view of the procession of the sons of educated men, probably because that first paragraph kind of ends on this procession of sons of educated men and it continues to remain a theme, this idea that women are amongst that procession is within sight of historic episodes to which she alludes, she's not referencing historic episodes, is symbolic of the legacy of past and present sons of educated men. She never really talks about the legacy of uh, these educated men and she never really kind of alludes to what they have done and created. So anyway, let's figure out if it's A or B, if it's a spot for fanciful reflection or it provides a good view of the procession. So, She's on this bridge. She says, close at hand is a bridge over the River Thames, an admiral vantage point for us to make a survey. So she chooses this bridge to be able to survey the landscape. 
She talks about the river beneath the timber on one side is a house of parliament and the city is a place to stand by the hour of dreaming, but not now. So she's not choosing this place right now for fanciful reflection. In other times you could, but she's saying now we're here for a different reason. Now we are here to fix our eyes upon the sons of educated men. So why does she choose the bridge? Because they can uh, look at the sons of educated men and that kind of forms the basis of her argument. Okay, let's look at 36. So Wolf indicates that the procession she describes in the passage, so we wanna see how she feels about this procession or the sons of educated men. So has come to have more practical influence in recent years. So she doesn't really talk about uh, the influence as being like practical. Um, uh, having like a pragmatic day-to-day -day influence on society has become a celebrated feature of, so she doesn't talk about anything being celebrated or praised, includes all of the richest and most powerful men in English society. She does talk about it, including men in prominent positions, but all is an absolute, and we have to be really careful with that. Every word has to check out. Has become less exclusionary in its membership in recent years. It has, because now women are kind of trapezing or joining the end of this. And we need to find proof for that. So let's find the lines where we see women uh, going along at the end. Uh, I see it right here. But now for the past 20 years or so, it is no longer a site of merely a photograph or fresco scrawled upon the walls of time at which we can look for merely an aesthetic appreciation. For there, trapezing along the tail end of the procession, we go ourselves. So line uh, 23 to 24 shows that this procession has become more inclusionary. Just out of curiosity, I just wanna look back at it, has, uh, has come to have practical influence in recent years. Yeah, I mean, you can take your own time. This is from SAT test one. I should have said that at the beginning of the video. This is SAT test one. And uh, the group of questions is uh, 32 to 41. But if you want to look back at each one of these individually, you're not going to see anything alluding to the jobs being more practical than they've been in the past. Uh, and that's a big thing, is if you see the word more, it establishes a comparison. And there's no real comparisons that she's making between the past and the present as far as practicality. Um, OK. Wolf characterizes the questions in lines 53 to 57 as both. So these questions we'll want to look back at. And the questions are, the questions that we have to ask and to answer about the procession during this moment of transition are so important. And they may well change the lives of all men and women forever. And these in questions are important and they have very little time to answer them. And what are the questions? The questions are, uh, do we wish to join the procession? Uh, on what terms shall we join? And above all, where is the procession leading us? So how does she characterize these questions? She characterizes them as very important and uh, you know, very pressing. Uh, there's not a lot of time to answer them. They're not controversial. They are weighty, but they're not unanswerable. Uh, they're not mysterious, okay which choice provides the best evidence? So this one's linked as well. And I think we kind of found the evidence. It's before she asks the questions. So 48 to 49 says, and they are very important questions and we have very little time. So that's what we want. All right, awesome. So two more questions left. So 40. Which choice most closely captures the meaning of the figurative sixpence referred to in line 70 to 71? So this is a tough one. This one challenges a lot of people because it's a word used figuratively. The women haven't literally earned coins. They've earned kind of uh, capital or influence. So coins in the sense of their ability to influence society. So how does she use it in 70 to 71? She goes, it was thus, so this, thinking that women did uh, while they were kind of stirring the pot while they rocked the cradle. It was thus that we won, won us the right to our brand new sixpence. It falls to us now to go on thinking how we are to spend that sixpence. 
So when she talks about the right to the brand new sixpence and how to spend it in context of kind of as women, we have this new opportunity to press for an expanded role in society. She's saying this, this expanded role that we've gotten and this opportunity to expand it even further, that's the sixpence she's talking about. So she's not talking about tolerance. She's not talking about knowledge. She's not talking about perspective. She's talking about kind of what women want to press for as far as their role in society. Okay, the range of places, places and occasions listed in 72 to 76 mainly serves to emphasize how. So this is where she's talking about uh, where women must think to answer the question of, the pressing question of what role they want in society. Let us think in offices, on buses, in crowds, in galleries, at baptisms, at marriages, at funerals. In other words, she's saying, let us think everywhere and at all times about this question. So she's not trying to show how new the question is by saying, let us think everywhere. Uh, she is trying to show how pervasive or kind of spread throughout society this need for reflection is. Uh, complex, the political and social issues of the day are, uh, thinking everywhere doesn't necessarily mean complexity. Enjoyable, the career possibilities for women are. Again, her pressing to think everywhere doesn't necessarily mean enjoyment. You have to be very careful at the distinction between what you can is stated or implied in the passage, so what you can prove, and what you would have to assume. And if you find that you are pressing for something that you couldn't directly point to line numbers, where it's either stated or implied, then you have to be careful selecting that answer choice. Anyway, this is uh, the last of the four SAT reading videos. I hope that this series of videos are helpful and that you feel like you have a good game plan of how to uh, develop on this section. Okay, feel free to return for any other videos on grammar or math. Bye.